seated. Well, good morning, church. Hopefully you all have recovered from last night as we were here. But I think it ended pretty early, so it was pretty good. Um, I just want to thank Pastor and the elders for another opportunity to come stand before you all and share from God's word. And I also just wanted to say thank you to all the Sunday school teachers, volunteers, parents for bringing your kids last night and making the event possible. And hopefully in the coming days, we also get to continue to see our kids grow up in the word of God. Um, this morning, let's just start with a word of prayer. Father God, I thank you for allowing us just to come to your presence today, God. I thank you that you've been with us thus far throughout the year. God, thank you for meeting us on this last day in the seventh month, God. We ask that as we continue to move further today, we ask that you just be with us and be in this place. We ask that every fear I have, every doubt, you ask that you just remove. And we ask that this morning, I just be faithful to bring forth the word you've laid in my heart. I thank you for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So if we turn our Bibles to Sam's chapter 90, this is where I want to take us this morning. And it's a familiar Sam to many of us, but what I'd like to do is provide some context to something we've already read before. So if we turn to verse 10 to 14, that will be our main meditation this morning. Sam's chapter 90, verse 10 to 14. And reading it, it says, the years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble, and they are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. If while I was doing research to understand the psalm a little more, I learned that this was written by Moses and it's considered to be one of the oldest psalms in the Bible. And when you do more research, you learn that this is actually written in the time period in the Bible that happens in Numbers chapter 20. And to provide some context, during this chapter in Numbers, we see that uh, Moses has just lost his sister Miriam and that his brother has died too. And on top of losing his family, we also see that God um, punishes him for a mistake he makes. If we turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32, we see God speaking to Moses about what happened. In verse 48, it says, that very day the Lord spoke to Moses, go up onto this mountain of Abram on Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, opposite of Jericho, and view the land of Cana, which I'm giving to the people of Israel for a possession. Go die on this mountain which you go up and be gathered to your people as Aaron your brother died in Mount Hor and was gathered to his people because you broke faith with me in the midst of the people of Israel at the waters of Mirbah Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin and because you did not treat me as holy in the midst of the people of Israel. For you shall see the land before you but you shall not go there into the land that I am giving to the people of Israel. In Numbers chapter 20, we see the people of Israel ask for water to be filled and quenched. And as they do this, God commands Moses to take his staff and lift it over a rock and command it to pour out water. But before Moses does that, the people begin to grumble and the people begin to complain. And in his anger and his frustration, Moses takes his staff and he strikes the rock twice. And even though waters begin to flow, God tells him he's no longer able to enter into the promised land. He's only able to view it from a distance. And if we put ourselves in Moses' shoes this morning, how would you feel? How would you feel if you spent the last decades of your life listening to people grumble and complain about every step you take, every action you make? All you're trying to do is be obedient to God and all you hear are complaints. And at the end of it, God tells you, you're not gonna experience the promise that everyone else will. All you'll do is see it. If I was in Moses' shoes, I think I would be questioning whether or not obedience is worth it. I think I'd be questioning whether or not it's worth to be faithful to God if all I'm going to experience is pain and hardship, and at the end of the day, just look at what other, everything that everyone else will receive. But when we look at this chapter, that's not what Moses does. He has realizations that are profound and that can impact the way we live our lives today. Because a lot of us right now are in a season, whether we're praying for a job, a spouse, our education, our career, different things. How would we respond if God says no to that? 
And what I'd like to do is go back to Psalms chapter 90 and analyze Moses' response to God saying no. If we turn to verse um, 10 and 12, we'll see Moses' first response. And it says, the years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Moses' first realization was that life is short. A lot of us only come to this realization at the end of our life after we've wasted the last 70 to 80 years. But Moses standing there realized that life is short. And thinking about it today, how many of us will still be here in 50 years? In 100 years, I don't think any of us will still be here. So this morning, can we get this idea that life is short as we move further? Amen. The second realization that Moses had is in verse 14. And Moses writes, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Even after hearing he's not going to enter the promised land, Moses realizes he can be satisfied. He can be satisfied not in his family, not in the position he has, not in the authority he has, not in the miracles he's performed, but he can be satisfied in God's steadfast love. And this morning we were thinking, how marvelous is that love? And this morning, can we come to a place, even if the answer to our prayer is no, can we be satisfied in God's love? Even if we keep praying and seeking after God for something and the answer is no and we don't get what we were looking for, can we be satisfied in God's love? But I don't think I can be satisfied if I don't know what God's love is for me. And as I was praying at different ways to present God's love, I felt the Holy Spirit leading me to Hebrews chapter 12, to where the writer presents what God's love is to us. If we go to Hebrews chapter 12, I'll be reading from verse 1 to 3. And the author writes, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run the race with endurance that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary and faint-hearted. In this chapter, we learn that the steadfast love God showed us is that his son died for us on the cross. God, looking down from heaven, saw that we had no way to be in a relationship with him. And from that, he said, I'll make a way by sending my own son to die on the cross. And as Jesus walked on this earth, he took nails in his body. And as the pain was inflicting his body, all he could think about was making sure that we wouldn't grow weary in the life we're called to while we're here on this earth. But after we knowing the steadfast love, what should our response be? The writer says, run the race with endurance. With the 70 to 80 years you've been blessed with on this earth, we need to run the race with endurance. But what does that look like? Because each of us will have a unique race that's set before us. And how can we run it faithfully so that at the end of our 70 years, we've been faithful to what God has called us to do? I think oftentimes what happens when we learn about our race is that we'll start looking to other people. We see this happen in John chapter 21 when Jesus is about to commission Peter. We see Jesus come up to Peter and ask him a question. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And all three times, Jesus is a, Peter is able to say, yes, Lord, I love you. But then after Jesus tells him what his call is, what his future looks like, what is Peter's response? We turn to John chapter 21 and we'll be reading from verse 18. And then Jesus said to Peter, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But now when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. And this Jesus said to show him by what kind of death Peter was going to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to Peter, follow me. But Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them the one who was also leaning against Jesus during the supper. And he said, Lord, who's going to betray you? And when Peter saw this disciple, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Amen. 
I think a lot of us, once we learn what our calling is from God, immediately what we want to do is look at what John's calling is. We want to le learn what everyone else is doing. But what did the author of Hebrews say? He said, look to Jesus when you learn your calling, when you learn the race that's set before you. And what does looking to Jesus look like today? It's reading the word of God, fasting, tearing for his presence. It doesn't matter what the person to your left or right has for their life. You focus on what God is calling you to do this morning. But in our own weakness, in our own flesh, we won't be able to look to Jesus every day. No matter how hard I try, no matter how much I want to, my flesh will want to pull me away from God and what he has called for me. So how can we learn to be obedient to what God has called us to do? In Acts chapter 20, we see Paul has come to a point in his life where he's able to submit to God and follow after him wholeheartedly. But what is his secret? In Acts chapter 20, I'll be reading from 22 to 24, Paul is speaking to the elders in Ephesus and he says, and now behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there except that the Holy Spirit is testifying in every city, imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Amen. This morning, can we come to a place where we don't view our life of any value if we don't complete our race? Can we look at our lives as worthless without doing what Jesus called us to do? And how did Paul do it? It says that in the first verse. He says, I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit. I think a lot of times when we think about the Holy Spirit, we just want to think about freedom or the freedom from just to do whatever we want. But in this passage, the Holy Spirit is literally dragging Paul to a place where he will be imprisoned and face affliction. And a lot of us, if we think about affliction and imprisonment, we think that's a slowdown to our ministry. We think that any resistance is a slowdown. But I was reading this morning in Philippines that Paul said, even in my imprisonment, the gospel was advanced. Even to the guards who were to my left and right, the gospel was shared. And this morning, we don't have to worry about the resistance or the afflictions we face because all of that is part of God's plan for our life. This morning, God isn't telling you to run faster. He's not telling you to run slower. He's telling you to complete your race. Amen. You have only a certain amount of time on this earth, and your goal is to complete what he's called you to do. Amen. This morning, can we be satisfied in God's love and move further to what he's calling us to do? And I think as I'm speaking this, it's something that God's been convicting me of, too. I think I've always had an idea of what my life should look like, and that's what God will be faithful in. But this morning, God's asking me, will you submit your will to be and be submitted to my Holy Spirit to be faithful to what I'm calling you to do? It might not be what you pictured. It might not be what you thought it would be. You might not look successful in the world's eyes, but will you be obedient to me? And as I'm ending, what I want to do is come back to Psalms chapter 90 with this idea in our head of what it looks like to fulfill that race we're called to on earth. Can we read Moses' words one more time and make it a prayer over our life that we want to be faithful to what God is calling us to do? In Psalms 90, verse 10 to 14, Moses writes, the years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble they are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and the wrath according to the fear of you? Teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. And I think it's easy to come look at the story of Moses and say he got shortcutted or he got cheated from experiencing the goodness of God. But what do we see in the New Testament? We see that as Jesus is standing on the Mount of Transfiguration, he's standing with two people. He's standing with Elijah and he's standing with Moses. 
So even though Moses didn't get to see the promised land during his lifetime, he got to see the promise, the thing that everything he's been doing was about. By faith, he considered it worth leaving the pleasures of Egypt for Christ. He knew that one day he would be with his Lord and Savior. And I think it's so easy for us to get caught up into the 70 to 80 years we have here on earth. But our goal should be the eternity we have after. That one day, if we're faithful here, we will be with our Savior. We will be in a place where there's no pain, no suffering, and we will see the glorified Christ in his fullness. This morning, I just want to end off with prayer. Father God, I thank you for allowing us just to come to your presence. I thank you that you sent your son to die on the cross for us, God. I thank you that while we were still sinners, you saw us as something to be valued, something to be treasured, God. And as we only have a short amount of time here on earth, God, help us to be faithful, God. Help us just to be satisfied with your steadfast love like we heard. It never changes yesterday, today, and forever. You are the same, God. Help us to just be satisfied in that. And as we run the race you've called us to, God, help our eyes to be set on you. Help us not to look to our left or right, God, but encourage one another to look to Jesus today. Look to the cross, look to Calvary where your blood was running so red for us, God. Help us to be faithful in that, God. And we ask that one day as we continue to be submitted to your spirit, that we get to see you in your holy form, God, that we get to see you in heaven and just be with you forever, God. I thank you for all that you're doing, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I think Ben John's coming up for announcements.